Well, we're going to get back to the book of Acts. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 17. Acts 18, ministering in Corinth. Ministering Corinth is the uh, title of our sermon today. And let me go ahead and give you the outline. Uh, it's in your program there if you picked one up. Number one, a divine appointment. A divine appointment. Folks, God's always up to something. Okay? God puts people in your pathway for a reason. And we need to remember uh, God and we have divine appointments. Number two, a spiritual battle. A spiritual battle. Wherever God's work is going on, there's going to be a spiritual battle. Okay? You are going to have spiritual warfare and Satan is not going to be happy with you. Especially the closer you get to Jesus Christ. Number three, an unusual intervention. An unusual intervention. God can use anyone, all right, for his ministry and for his glory. So let's look in Acts chapter 18, verse 1. Paul's life is living proof that ministry can be extremely challenging. Uh, Paul was beaten and imprisoned at Philippi, if you remember. Jewish leaders stirred up trouble for Paul in Thessalonica and in Berea, causing him to have, have left those towns for his own safety. In Athens, he preached his heart out and debated men with brilliant minds only to see a few professions of faith. But we know Paul wasn't a quitter and kept his faith throughout his second missionary journey. Charles Spurgeon once reminded his church that it was through perseverance that the two snails reached the ark. All right? <laughs> Boy, y'all are a little slow on that, all right? <laughs> Snails are slow. Just thought of another one, all right, while we're there. What did the snail say on the turtle's back? Wee! <laughs> it just came up, all right? It just came up. Paul left Athens and walked 50 miles to Corinth, okay? Walking 50 miles. All right, that's a long ways, folks. Paul left Athens and, and went to Corinth, and Corinth was a town of over 200,000 people and was one of the leading towns with a strong commercial and p political presence there. It boasted of having the temple of Aphrodite, who was the goddess of love. Temple prostitutes were seen in this wicked city where immorality abounded. Paul was alone in ministry, uh, but, uh, but again, he saw Corinth as a huge mission field. So let's look at ministering in Corinth, a divine appointment. After these things, which I mentioned in the introduction, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. He found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in pa uh, Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. And there was great indication that they were already saved when, he met, when they met Paul. They were from Rome, and uh, because of persecution, they had to flee. And there was a good chance in reading Paul's writing later on uh, that they were par part of the church, a uh, New Testament church in Rome, and he, and he came to them. And folks, you have to understand how important friends are. Okay, friends are very important. Folks, we all need friendships. We all need partners in ministry. Uh, bottom line, folks, we need one another as Christians. And really, there shouldn't be anybody that's just a lone ranger, all right? And I'm telling you, what's going on right now is isolation and the quarantines and people are getting down i read a stat the other day that said uh, people are more depressed right now than they've ever been and folks i'm telling you what you have to understand is you're never alone god is always there the holy spirit is always with you and we need to thank god for our friends ecclesiastes chapter four go there with me if you would Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Two are better than one. Why? Because of company. Because of Christian fellowship. 
Two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. Nobody likes to dig a ditch by themselves, okay? I want somebody helping me. I'm calling somebody and, and seeing if they will help me. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls. And folks, I am telling you, Satan preys on isolation. Satan messes with our minds. Satan tells you that nobody cares. And you in your heart of hearts know that is not true. God cares for you. Jesus died for you. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of comfort. But having friends is so important. One of the things I want to challenge you today to do is uh, communicate more with your friends. Pick up the phone. Send them a card. Send them a text. You know, fellowship, even though we cannot be with one another. And folks, I hate that we cannot uh, shake hands. I hate it that we cannot hug one another. But we have to do this for our health's sake right now. And I cannot wait for the day when we can get back to church in a normal way. Verse 11, again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And again, folks, the key is working together. Working together. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. I mean, most of the time, one person is not going to fight with two people, all right? That's why it's good to have a companion. That's why it's good uh, to have people around you. And it says in, in this, uh, uh, a three-cord fold is not quickly broken. Folks, Satan is trying to break us down. He is. And we do not need to fall prey to him. We are never alone. We have Christian friends. We have Christian fellowship. As a matter of fact, when I thought of a three, three-fold cord, we have God the Father. We have Jesus the Son. And we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. So we are never alone alone. God gave a divine appointment to Paul, and, and we know it was Aquila and Priscilla. And folks, the other thing I want you to see here is God's timing is always right. God's timing is always right. He left Silas and Timothy to do ministry and discipleship behind him. So he'd been traveling by himself traveling and and he get he he had been weary another thing uh, indication was he was ill also all right paul had health problems according to the word of god and sometimes in our minds you know we 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 are worse uh, you know the attacks are worse when we don't feel go, good but we need to thank god for friends verse 3 so because he was of the same trade he stayed with them and worked for by occupation, they were tent makers. And in those days, especially in those days, a father would teach his son a trade. All right? Uh, G I mean, Jesus' uh, uh, father, uh, Joseph, was uh, worked as a carpenter, as we know. All right? And, and obviously, Saul or Paul's father was a tent maker. And part of being a tent maker was working with leather. Okay? And... And there's all indication, Paul said, in several places that, that we need to work. We need to work with our hands. Uh, whatever we do, we need to do it. We need to be good uh, employees. We need to be hard workers as a testimony to others. And so, uh, you know, with the tent-making business, Paul would work during the week uh, with Aquila and Priscilla. And then on the weekends, uh, he would go to the synagogues, the Bible says. Second Th Thessalonians, Paul says this here in Second, Second Thessalonians. Hold your finger there and go to Second Thessalonians 3 uh, with me. Second Thessalonians 3, verse 6. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from uh, every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Folks, we need to, you know, choose our friends wisely. Young people, listen to me. You need to have Christian friends. 
they will get you in trouble. Not, not them. Other friends will get you in trouble. All right? You need to, to have fellowship people with the same mind. And we influence one another. And I've seen good Christian uh, young people fall prey to Satan and, and bad friendships. In verse 7, For you yourself know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we may not be a burden to any of you. You know, before, even, I, I haven't heard it lately, but even as I was growing up, you know, there was an indication that preachers did not work. I even had a man tell me one time uh, that he said, man, I wish I had your job. Of course, I didn't respond to that. You know, I didn't know where he was going or what he was going to say. You only work one day a week. And I'm like, do you not think I study for my sermons? Do you not think I visit hospitals and do these things? But again, I learn to keep my mouth shut, all right? And folks, even I've heard the phrase that some pastors are lazy. And Paul was not lazy. Paul worked with his hands. And whatever he did, he did it with his heart. Now look at verse 9. Not because we do not have the authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Folks, everything falls on leadership. I cannot ask you to do something that I would not do myself. And leadership is very, very important. And look at verse 10. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Folks, working is good. Working is wholesome. We need to pull our weight when we work. And we need to work, the Bible says, as unto the Lord. Now look at verse 4 back in our text. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Again, he reason was more of a teaching time. Reason was more of a question and answer time. And he always, any town he went into, he went to the synagogue first. So this pattern is seen throughout uh, his ministry. Well, we see a divine appointment, and I want you to see a spiritual battle. A spiritual battle. True ministry will always be opposed by evil forces, folks, always. And when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is Christ. Folks, Paul didn't back up. Paul didn't shut up. I'm telling you, Paul preached Jesus Christ. It didn't matter where he was, whether he was on a street corner, wherever he was teaching, Wherever he was making tents, he was testifying and preaching the gospel. Verse 6, but when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to him, unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. Now, folks, when we see this, being opposed is one thing, all right? But he, these people, these Jewish folks hated Paul because uh, they, they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And there's one thing to oppose some, someone, but they blasphemed. And it's not just Paul that they attacked. They blasphemed Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, that got Paul fired up. You have to realize blaspheming the Holy Spirit, that is the only unpardonable sin. We are talking serious stuff here. I'm amazed that we holler freedom of speech and freedom of speech, but when we Christians give our opinion, people don't like that. And I don't know why we are surprised about that, because folks, this world, it is darkness and it is light. You know, the world doesn't want us to succeed. The, war, the world doesn't want to hear about Jesus Christ. So these uh, folks, I'm telling you, they were not just opposing Paul. They were being mean and ugly and blaspheming our Lord Jesus Christ. So he shook off his garments. Hold your finger there and go with me to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. Because Jesus 
had given the disciples, uh, you know, instructions when he sent them out. Mark 6, verse 7. The Bible says, And he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. And he commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. What is he saying? Hey, they, they were sent out just to trust the Lord, to trust the Lord. And he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. What is it saying? Folks, I'm telling you, sometimes when you share the gospel, people are going to not like what you are saying. They're going to be mean to you. There's going to be persecution. And folks, I am telling you, the longer we live, the longer we live in these days, the persecution is going to get worse. And so what he's saying is, don't let it bother you. Don't let it discourage you. Don't give up. All right? Don't say it's not worth it. We are not here, and again, I'm not talking about thumping people over the head with your Bible. The folks, the truth of the truth, and we need to share the truth with everyone we come in contact with. And it says, as assuredly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah uh, in the day of judgment than for that city. What is he saying? We know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. It was destroyed. But what Jesus was saying, I'll take care of them. You take care of yourself. You keep being a Christian. You keep being an example for others to follow. You keep sharing the gospel. You keep sharing your testimony. And if people don't like you or if people start talking about you, just dust your feet off and go on. Now look at verse 12. So they went out and preached that people should repent. And they cast out many demons anointed uh, and anointed with oil, many who were sick, and healed them. What were these disciples doing? They were touching people's lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What were they doing? They were praying in faith, believing that God could heal these folks. Folks, man has no healing power. It is God. It is God. And we shouldn't be discouraged when people don't accept our message. We just have to move on. We just have to not look back. We just have to keep going. Because, folks, we don't know who's saved and who's not. We don't know when God's going to uh, you know, intervene and when he's not. So our job is simply to be disciples for him. Now look back in our text. And your blood will be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Folks, this was a defining moment in Paul's life. Paul was saying, my whole ministry so far has been to the Jews. I've went into the synagogues. I've went, you know, and again, he's not going to stop going in there. But his focus from here out is on the Gentiles. In verse 7, and he departed from there and entered a house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God. And knowing the name Justice, it was a Roman name. So the first person he comes in contact with is a Gentile. I just think it's neat how God has another divine appointment for him. And it says, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Folks, I don't believe in accidents. I don't believe in happenstance. I believe our very steps are ordered by God. And when you lose a friendship or you lose that, I believe with all my heart, God is going to replace them and give you someone else. And folks, I will say this, there is no friend like Jesus. There's none, okay? Even in Lauren's song, through it all, through it all, folks, we, we've all had heartbreaks. We've all been discouraged sometimes in our life. But our friend Jesus never leaves us and never forsakes us. Then the Bible says, then Crispus, verse 8, the ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed 
and were baptized. What did God do? Because Paul had the right attitude, because Paul wasn't discouraged, he could have just threw in the towel and said, you know what, I don't like this town anyway. It reminds me of Athens. I'm just going to go on. But he kept preaching the gospel. He kept teaching the gospel. He reached out to the Gentiles. And I'm telling you, many Gentiles were saved. Uh, the same thing happened at the Philippian jailer with all his household and believed and were baptized. So as soon as that happened, as soon as he, he stayed on track, as soon as he determined in his heart he was not going to be run out of Corinth, God blessed his ministry. He not only blessed his ministry, but he encouraged Paul. Look at this next verse, verse 9. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night, in, in the night by a vision. Do you realize Paul's salvation experience started out with a vision? It started out at a vision, with a vision. And Paul, in the New Testament, if you read it carefully, had six visions altogether. And again, that was just the way God communicated to Paul. How do you know? It's like today. People ask me, how do you know, Mike? How do you know what to do? Because the Holy Spirit speaks to me. Because I know if I will pray, if I will read the Bible, if I will seek God's face, then the answer will come. Back then, God used visions. And listen what he said. Listen, and again, this is red writing. So this is Jesus speaking. Okay, Jesus, do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent. Okay, the encouragement from Jesus Christ himself, for I'm with you and no one will attack you and hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Folks, he had been attacked. He had been beaten and thrown into prison. Later on, it, you know, the, the stoning there and left for dead. You will see that. All these things have happened to him. But, but God, through Jesus, was saying, you're going to be fine. And what did he mean by, I have many people in the city? We were talking about, about election uh, two weeks ago. And God was telling him, there's still people that need to be saved. That's why God hasn't come yet. That's why Jesus and the rapture of the church hasn't come yet. Because there are those who still need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among uh, them. So we see Paul there and, and we see how Jesus Christ himself encouraged Paul. Look with me. Hold your finger there and go to Psalms 31 with me. Psalm 31. We're going to look at a couple of psalms today. Psalm 31. And if you see the title under there, it says, The Lord, a fortress in adversary. Folks, people are going to come against us. People are going to not like us. People are going to talk about us. And we need to just depend on on the Lord. You, in you, Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock and refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. Folks, I shouldn't even worry about defending myself. God is my refuge. God is my defender. Verse 3, for you... For you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Folks, listen to the Holy Spirit. Follow what God and Jesus is telling you. Verse 4, pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Now look down in verse 23 and verse 24. Oh, love the Lord, all you saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful and fully repays the proud person. Folks, I am telling you, God will take care of you. All right? You do not need to get vengeance. That is God's job. Verse 24, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. So we see a divine appointment. We saw a spiritual battle, but God 
came to, to Paul through Jesus Christ and encouraged him in the faith. And the last thing I want you to see is an unusual intervention. An unusual intervention. When Gallio, who was a proconsul of Acadia, and again, a governor, a governor, uh, that's of Asia Minor, by the way, and the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Folks, Paul was a Roman citizen. Paul at one time was persecuting Christians, and we know he got saved. And God totally changed his life. And here, it was just an attack from people. All right, they, they saw these people being saved. They saw lives being changed. They saw that God was working uh, in Paul's life. And, and, and they just wanted to attack him personally. So there's a thing called the judgment seat, and basically it's an outside court, all right? It was, it was usually attached to the governor's house and, and there where he could come out and he could make decisions. And if I had, uh, you know, a problem with a person or if I wanted to have a civil suit or something, uh, you know, in this case, they were just trying to shut Paul up. They were just trying to say, hey, he is not one of us. We are not of his type, Okay. All right, we are not. And, and he took them, he took these, Paul to the judgment seat. Now look at verse 14. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would have be a reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names in your own law, look to it yourselves. For I do not want to be a judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. Here is a, I mean, basically working for the Roman government. There was no indication that this governor was saved. But God used him to have justice in Paul's life. Paul had done nothing wrong. Paul was a Christian. Paul was a Jew by birth. But yet his own people rejected him and they were wanting him run out of town or arrested arrested for that's what the judgment seat was for but God intervened oh listen to me folks and I know the biggest thing when we feel like there's a, you know an injustice to us is we want God to work right then okay and folks we a lot of times I believe God is teaching us patience all right, the truth is going to come out. God is going to prevail. And sometimes we just need to learn to wait on the Lord. So he told them, hey, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he can go. He can go a free man. Then verse 17, then all the Greeks took Sotheus, the ruler of the synagogue, he was the new one, and beat him before the judgment seat, but Gallio took no notice of these things. Oh, folks, you have to understand, you know, what the world is about. They really don't care who, when they're angry and when they're mad and when they're, you know, acting like reprobates. Folks, I'm telling you, uh, you know, they, they, they just don't care. People these days, I'm telling you, there's such a lack of love. There's so much division. There's so much hate these days. And these are the times. And, and a lot of times, you know, we say it's unprecedented, but there's examples in the Word of God of these things that went on uh, all the time. So we should not be surprised, is what I'm trying to say, and of these things that are going on, even though sometimes it shocks us or it catches us off guard. The bottom line is this. It's good versus evil. And in the end, folks, God wins. God wins. And we need to remember that. I'm telling you, uh, you know, uh, Judaism in those days was pretty much tolerated by the uh, Roman government, but God intervened uh, for the Apostle Paul. And uh, I, hate, I hate that, a, you know, pretty much an innocent man, a new guy, and uh, he, I guess the crowd thought he did not 
protect the synagogues and the Jewish faith well enough is why he was beaten. But through all this, folks, Paul was strengthened by his new friends. Paul was strengthened and encouraged by the new converts. And Jesus' words and God's words reigned over all. Psalm 27. Go with me. Psalm 27. I want to read this. If you're here and you're discouraged today, I'm telling you, just pick up the Psalms. The Psalms are scriptures of comfort. They are songs of comfort. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise up against me, this I will be confident. The one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Folks, that's why we gather on Sundays and we gather on Wednesdays. A lot of times we go out and we get beat up and we've had a bad day and people are being ugly to us and uh, people are lying about us and people are just not being nice. And folks, that's why we come to a sanctuary. It's not an auditorium. It's a sanctuary. It's a place where God lives. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion and in the secret place of His tabernacle he shall hide me, and he shall set me upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And I thank God for Brother Steve and for our praise team. Folks, I'm telling you, it, the singing and the melody gets our hearts ready for worship. Then one last scripture, and I'm through. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. I know you know this, but I just want to remind you as we close. Verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He knows where you're at. He knows what's going on in your, in your life. He knows what you're thinking. He knows your attitudes. He knows everything about you. Verse 29, He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Folks, abiding in Christ gives us strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. and They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Oh, my Christian brother and sister, I hope you understand that God is here to support you. He's here to strengthen you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. Paul was in a lot of situations that he could have given up in, and most men would have given up up in. But Paul stayed the course. And I admonish you today as a Christian, as a fellow a brother in Christ, stay on track. Don't give up. Stay in the race. Run the race for Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. God, I thank You that uh, through Scripture You teach us that even in the worst of situations, You are working in our lives. God, I pray that You would encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ. God, I pray that they would just uh, leave here with a different attitude, Lord, an attitude that You are our rock, You are our salvation, You are our refuge. And in time, everything's going to be all right. God, I pray that we would just keep our eyes on you. 
God, I pray we would keep our, our, our face in the Word of God. I pray that we would be men and women of prayer. And God, I pray that we would cry out to You. God, uh, You are everything to us. You are our deliverer. God, encourage those who are discouraged this day. Walk with them. Uh, reveal Yourself to them. Fill them, Lord, with Your Holy Spirit. And God, if there's one here today that doesn't know You, if there's one here that hasn't trusted in You, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. Lord, if someone needs to come for baptism or, or come uh, to rededicate their life or even church membership, God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would impress them. And God, I pray that they would obey. God, this is Your church. This is Your invitation. This is Your time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?